those are interesting names from the past. Um, how, how did you, uh, one of the ones that intrigued me most was uh, the infamous Dr. Jerry Graham, who uh, is kind of like one of the, uh, with, within the wrestling business, is kind of like one of those legendary, uh, you know, in some ways tragic characters who kind of... Uh, Rags, riches to rags, and you know had a lot of uh, success, but kind of uh, invariably almost seemed to be his own worst enemy with the, the drinking and all the other debauchery right. and stuff, you know. But uh, how did you, how and when did you first hook up with uh, the good doctor, as my dad used to call him? Yeah, that's what we all call him, I think. Anyway, uh, met him in 1981. In Bakersfield, wow. California, I went up to see, I wasn't wrestling at the time, I was going to start in for uh, LaBelle down here in Los Angeles, but I heard that uh, Anton Leone was running shows in Central California. Ripper, so I went yeah. up to Bakersfield with some uh, Kurt Brown, I don't know if you know Kurt, and uh, John Tolos called Kurt over and asked if we'd give Jerry a ride home. Now, I didn't see Jerry work that night. So I didn't know how big he was, but I knew he was big. And uh, here he come and got in my car, and there I met Jerry Graham. And right away, my tag team partner maybe told him we were getting back in the business. And right away, Jerry says, I'll manage you. You can work for the Ripper. I'll manage you. And I thought, well, that's probably bullshit because uh, he was kind of at the end of his career right there. Although he did go on a few more years, but I met him in '81 and hung out with him until he died, with '97, I think. And he yeah, trained he me in how the, to uh, shoot. And sad to say, like the last 30 years of Jerry's career were like the, kind of the, <laughs> the downhill slide. You know, was, I remember the old fart was. Uh, he was up here for my dad in the early 60s after he had, he had had a pretty, you know, uh, epic run in uh, in New York for Vince Sr. He and uh, his so-called brother, Eddie Graham, yeah. they were uh, working a lot with Argentina Rocca and all like that in the late 50s. They were the big ticket. And then uh, Jerry came up to Calgary in the early 60s and... Uh, yeah, I remember that. And he, brought he was already on him. the uh, downhill slide then, you know. He was having a lot of alcohol problems. And as you probably saw, when he was like one of those kind of ugly Oh, drunks. yeah. He, I've never well, seen he anybody drink, drink as much it. as him except Andre. <laughs> and, uh, and he disappeared for a few years. I remember he came back to Calgary in the late, I think it was about 1970 or so, and my dad had a big... Uh, football player, bodybuilder, muscle head type that he was breaking in at the time named Wayne Coleman. And oh, yeah. uh, Jerry uh Jerry staggered into the dressing room. I think he had messed himself and he, he was uh in a pretty rough state and, uh, <laughs> I remember he's he staggered into the dressing room in Calgary and uh my dad had this big uh Wayne Coleman and uh, another big football player named Angelo Mosca. They were kind of breaking in yeah. at that time. And uh, I think Jerry had ex- excrement on his uh, hands and you know, <laughs> a pretty rough state. And he, and he uh, comes up to this Wayne Coleman and, and it says, my name is Balls. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I remember Jerry Graham, uh, I mean, uh, Wayne Coleman squeezed Jerry's head and <laughs> brought him to his knees and said, my, my name is Dick, you go. <laughs> that was the first meeting between them. And uh, about a month later, Dr. Jerry had uh, persuaded Coleman to leave Calgary, and he took him down to uh, Los Angeles, maybe for Mike LaBelle or whatever, and he changed. It. He convinced Coleman to change his name to Superstar Billy Graham, you know, which became a, the big ticket. You know, he yeah. later on became like the uh, WWE World Champion and was like kind of one of those big superstars of that era. But uh, some other Dr. Jerry, uh, you know, uh, 
tagged along for a while, and he had done the same back in the early 60s with us. My dad had another big kind of guy he was breaking in named uh, cra- and turned out to be crazy Luke Graham, but Doctor right. Jerry kind of, uh, you know, took him under his wing. And but uh, yeah, he was he was uh, he's kind of one of those polarizing figures in the business, old Doctor Jerry, because he actually had uh, he had some uh, uncanny ability to get heat. You know, he knew how to kind of talk the talk and had not bad ring psychology. From what my dad told me, he was pretty. You know, good at, at kind of uh, generating heat and whatever he did seemed to get over, even though. Near oh the yeah, end I he got was, he was, the first night I worked at a wrestle in Bakersfield, and he was with us. I became immediately hated up there, just walking out to the ring with him. Oh yeah, he, he seemed to have throwing the, uh, shit at us and the, the heel stick down, you know, and uh, he didn't do that much, you know. He, by the end, you know, he wasn't able to do too much, you know. He was in such. Uh, no, all Awful. he could do was blade. And that was yeah, the, like, about he it. had, you know, he he was so out of shape, and uh, he almost had like a, you know, he, he looked kind of like a more, you know, grotesque version of Adrian Adonis later on, with the big, the big belly and the skinny little arms and the skinny right. legs. You know? <laughs> and he didn't do too much else other than uh, blade and uh, did a bit of, you know. You, you know, yeah, we were scheduled of, to go to Africa and Haiti in '84, I think it was. And uh, I can only imagine, you know. Uh, <laughs> and I'm uh, glad we didn't go. I uh, ripped out my knee right before we went, so I couldn't. We couldn't go. But I can only imagine the trouble he'd get in over there. The funny thing is, I was told he was uh, uh, one of Vince McMahon Jr.'s. Uh, when Vince, I guess, was growing up or, you know, kind of a kid around the business back in the 50s, uh, I've read uh, many different places that Vince admired. That was like his big, uh, you know, kind of hero or the guy that he uh, aspired to or whatever back in the day. And then uh, I was told later on near maybe the end of his life in the 80s or something, uh Vince uh, actually tried to get Jerry Graham. I know my my brothers told me that when they were down in WWE that Dr. Jerry was uh, being brought back by uh, Vince, and Vince had him in a dry out to like a Betty Ford type place, and was right. and he was gonna bring him back to uh, have another run. And we were all intrigued, you know, because. Uh, as I said before, he'd been on his last legs back in the '60s. You know? The yeah. most amazing thing was that he was still alive. You know, with all the, uh, you know, the whatever, the debauchery and the drinking and the, all the other stuff that he had done. You know, but uh, and I heard but he, I was uh, shocked felt, when he told me that he got him and me and two other guys to be his sons, and he went on the TNT Tuesday Night Titan show. And plugged us coming in, and I don't know how long I would have lasted. Vince probably would have fired me within a week, or I'd have quit. But we never. Well, then I had a deal with Pat Patterson that negated all of that, so we never did get in there. But probably just as well, I guess. Yeah, it was kind of. I think Jerry, by the end or the last thirty years of his career, was you know kind of taking guys like Billy Graham or or guys like you or whoever and uh and kind of tagging along for the ride but you know he he still had that ability to kind of most promoters even including my dad would kind of always uh you know give the old fart one more shot you know they'd always kind of you know, well, right. Yeah, yeah, when we were going to go to Africa, he said, well, you do all the work, and said, and I'll get the tag, or I'll get the pin. And I said, okay, fine. We were supposed to feud with uh, Bulldog Brower and Igor Vodic, and I thought it was a strange combination. <laughs> but I can only imagine. You know. They um, were all over the hill by then. <laughs> some of them never uh, were on the on the right side of the hill in the first place. <laughs> <Or wherever. laughs> no, that's the truth. Isn't, uh, Tom, Tom, 
Um, uh, we got a uh, we got a caller, Pierre from Victoria, British Columbia. He uh, said, uh, "Can you uh, ask?" He's been reading your book, and uh, he said he wanted to uh, ask uh, ask uh, Tom about uh, Jack Pfeiffer. If you have any comments about him, you, I think you may have met him somewhere in the in your day. About who? Jack Pfeiffer. Jack Pfeiffer. Oh, Jack Pfeiffer. Yeah, yeah I met him in 1964. I was on the way to the. New York he was one of those legendary old, uh, you know, characters. You know. Yeah, and I'd read about him in well. Ring Magazine, knew who he was and everything. I know and when I, I was a I kid, was... he used to send my dad these programs, you know, and it was amusing because he had all these guys that he would, uh, they're all kind of knockoffs of whoever was the big stars at the time, like Bruno Sammartino, where you'd have a guy named Bruno San Artino or something like that. Oh, yeah, like Pancho and, Valdez, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, you know, uh, Naldo Von Eric or uh, stuff like that, you know. And uh, yeah. he was kind of like, uh, I, my dad told me he had crossed paths with Jack Pfeffer back in the 40s when he was in uh, New York working for Tutsmont. And Vince Sr. was kind of like one of the... Uh, guys in the office at that time and Jack Pfeffer was right. gonna have but yeah, he he was one of those uh characters that his name's, you know, kinda almost synonymous with all the you know, kind of the the business going sideways type thing, you know, but Yeah. How did you cross paths with that old part of the uh, wrestling convention? Uh I would say guess up 15 or so and we had a luncheon actually I sat with Les Thatcher and uh, and after the luncheon we were sitting around talking with Angelo Poffo and Nikolai Volkov and Wilbur Snyder and the Bruiser and uh, Jack Pfeffer walks in and sits down so I started talking to him and he started asking about the Swedish angel and the French angel, and he, everybody he claimed to the, have discovered, Fargo brothers, he said he discovered, well, he did manage them and travel with them a lot. If you read Don Fargo's book, some great stories in there about Jack. And Jack was, uh, he was just seedy looking, but he was dressed up in a real fancy suit. It was fancy like 35 years ago. And smelled like it hadn't been cleaned in that amount of time. I'd always been told that about him that his personal hygiene was sometimes <laughs> not not that uh, you know up to scratch or whatever you know. But. And he said, "Well, I'm here. I'm going to help Fred Kohler. We're going to save Chicago." Angelo Pavo laughed in his face and said, <laughs> "Was old Fred be Kohler? The day. He, was Fred still? He was he in the uh, downside of his?" Career yeah, then, at like very end, yeah. He'd been uh, he'd been pretty iconic back in the fifties, old the uh, Marigold oh, yeah. or whatever, and the uh, you'd hear about Fred Kohler and uh, you know I'm not sure if it was the Bruiser or whoever Buddy Rogers, so they seemed to have a pretty good. They were like among the big players back in the fifties, and then Fred Kohler right. seemed to. Uh, I didn't. I never knew exactly what happened. He seemed to. Uh, fade during the 60s or whatever, you know. Oh, yeah, he brought in guys that, like Cowboy Bobo George or... Valentine, which was supposed to be like Johnny Valentine, but I think it was actually a Buddy Colt. Yeah, it's funny, some of the guys that he started, I was told another one he had started was Pat Patterson back yeah. in uh, maybe the late 50s, early 60s, somewhere he had Pat and... Uh, under some uh, some bogus name, you know, like one of those. And uh, but yeah, it, it, yeah, that's another name that uh, seems to have. Uh, it's a long time since I've heard the name Jack Pfeffer, but uh, yeah, he was. Yeah, well, like, even Harley Race worked for him under some other name for a while. Yeah, I, mean, I thought old Fargo maybe did, and. Uh, like some of those guys became like Buddy Colt, uh, Ron Reed, or whatever his name was. Uh, yeah, became a pretty uh, highly regarded heel back in the 
maybe the seventies I think was uh Yeah. I can't remember if he was part of that uh plane crash with Bobby Shane and that bunch. I can't right. remember. I I thought maybe he was, but uh did you, how did you hook up with uh Bruiser and Snyder? They were doing a thing down in uh was it Indianapolis or they had a bit yeah. of a so I know yeah, they we were, were promoting broken. there, and uh, I think my dad broke. Bruiser in just started recognizing himself as the WWA World Heavyweight Champion. I guess he came out to California and beat Bob Ellis or somebody, and uh, then he came back to Indianapolis and was World Champion for the old, better uh, part of the next what, thirty years. <laughs> Johnny Doyle was he part of that thing or? I remember my dad had an old fart up here who later, you know, kind of screwed him a few times, named Sam Meneker, but he uh, he was always, Johnny Doyle was one of his big cohorts, and I thought they were doing a lot of stuff in the, uh, maybe with Bruiser and uh, Snyder and that bunch in the uh Well, I think they were in the beginning, they were... But uh, I never met Johnny. But yeah, I, I just heard the name. I never, um, I never met him either. It's pretty young then. But uh, that was another one of those kind of. There's a, a group of them. You'd hear their names, and they're always kind of up up to something, you know. And uh, John right. Doyle and uh, a few others, you know. And did you ever have much involvement with Fern and Wally in that bunch, uh, Tom or? They were, they were uh, no, in fact, I moved to Minneapolis with the sole intention of getting Ganya to train me. But was, since I didn't have an athletic background, back then. he wouldn't even talk to me. I talked to Wally. I'd call him every day, like at 3 o'clock, and say, just give me one shot on TV. Give me a, Just give me a shot. Throw me in there with Murdoch and Rose. Let him beat the shit out of me. I said, I don't care. Just give me a shot. But he wouldn't do it. They, they and, were pretty... Uh, uh, pretty high and mighty back in the 70s the early the late 60s early 70s they were kind of the uh the, the <laughs> AWA was kind of like the, the territory you know to make money it was a tough place to get into I think my dad uh, yeah had, uh, it was they had so many top stars when I was living there that uh, I know my dad I just go to the matches Robinson. and sit there and study them they never had anybody actually train me until I got started uh, Harley Race smartened me up on the business after he saw that, that uh, I was determined. You know, taught me how to shake hands and said, well, you got to learn to lose before you win. And it all made sense to me. That was in case but I was living in Minnesota, came back to Iowa one weekend to visit my uh, family. And my tag team partner, Dan Daniels, we've been working out for... Gosh, a couple of years. Well, from '69 till '73, and in '73, early '73, we were working out in the ring in Cedar Rapids on a Sunday afternoon before the matches, and that was a boxing ring with no padding. So the guys hated working there. But and uh, the promoter at that time was Larry Lewis, and he washed us for a while, and he went down and got. Here he comes walking with Pat O'Connor, Bob Geigel, uh, the Viking, Danny Little Bear, Omar Atlas, and everybody on the card. He sat him down in the front row, and he goes, okay, boys, let's see what you got. I'm thinking, well, this is it. Better be good. So we had a like a 10, 15-minute match uh, what we'd worked on for a while. So we started in on that, and after about four minutes, he stopped us, and I thought, uh-oh. He says, you're ready. You're ready, boys. And uh, he said, call Mick Goulas. I'll give you his number. Call him. Tell him whatever you want. Let me know what you told him, and I'll back up your story. I'll tell him you've been working here. And we <laughs> never actually had a match yet. So I did that. I called Mick Goulas, and I talked him into booking this. And... Uh, Early in 73, we started in Johnson City, Tennessee. And it was our I first match. The they didn't know were, it. It was a I don't tag match. The payoffs were too good. Oh, they were 
terrible. There was we get seventy five bucks a week no matter where we worked. <laughs> and paying and your own trans. I thought he was screwing us, but I found out he's paying most guys that except the top guys. And they got uh, seventy six. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I remember he gave Jack Briscoe a bonus, made Jack so mad that he quit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was. Uh, <laughs> yeah, when he I fired me, I, I, I couldn't help but laugh at him. Uh, yeah, that was actually, one of those territories where uh, my dad had a ton of the Tennessee guys up here back in, and I always used to hear the stories of Nick Goulas' uh, penny pinching, uh, you know, ways or whatever, you know. Yeah. Oh, he was. He was. Uh, uh, how long did that that stint? That, that was kind of like the uh, Tennessee, from what uh, we always used to hear, was like one of those gimmick-oriented territories. And my dad said they have a tar and feathers match every night or some damn thing. You know, there's always some kind of yeah. Gimmick. There was always a lot of stuff he put in there, and. Uh, I don't know. He, we were, we'd been in the business a week at the time, and he said, "Well, I want you to." He wanted it was a tag team match. He wanted all four of us to bleed. I think he wanted to see if we had the guts to, you know, cut ourselves, or wanted to let somebody else do it. And I said, "No, I'd do it myself. It's no problem." And uh, so the referee had one blade to pass around when it came time for you to juice. It's probably and, uh, pre HIV was the first time or something. <laughs> And Nick could only afford one razor blade. And yeah, broke it up and sent it to a different parts of his territory. Yeah, I think use it use it for ten years. Or so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> those Gillette blue blades from back in the day. Or... <laughs> yeah, how long did that last for you, Tom, in Tennessee? That was. I was there about four months for Nick, and then I. Went one Saturday morning. We had a tag team match with uh, Jackie Fargo and J- uh, Jerry Jarrett. And, of course, we were putting them over, but we were supposed to split falls, and uh, which I didn't care either way. But uh, they took the first fall. We were, I was supposed to take the second fall on Fargo, and I went to pin him, but he turned me over and held my trunks and pinned me. Without telling me, if he'd have just told me I'm going to pin you, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have cared. But he no. didn't. I, I just out of the, out of the thin air, I said, "Oh fuck you, Fargo," and the camera was right on my face, a live TV, and I didn't realize it. And <laughs> when I got back to Nashville later that day, old Goulas was just waiting for me. He said, "What do you do down there on TV?" I said, "What do you mean?" He said, Station Man, you know how long we've been on TV down there? I said, No, Nick, how long? He said, 26 years. I said, Well, it's a long time, isn't it? And uh, he said, Well, they said if we ever brought you on TV again, he said they'd cancel us. I said, Well, that'd be a real shame, Nick. I knew right then he was going to fire me, and I was starting to laugh. And uh, he said, You think I'm funny? I said, Nick, I think you're fucking hilarious right now. I'm waiting for your head to explode. And he said, then Jarrett was there doing paperwork, and he looked up and said, you guys are fired. Which uh, didn't bother me, because Sam Bass had given me Saul Weingross' number a few weeks ago. He said, here, you'll probably need this down the road. And he was right. And I got a hold of Saul. They were running opposition to Nick and the Von Browner brothers, Phil Golden. It's kind oh, of yeah, a yeah. precursor to... Angelo Apoffel, because he was working there, too, and Lanny. and uh, Rand- Randy kicking around then, or he was... Uh, no, I never saw him. He may have still been playing baseball then or something, I don't know. Yeah, I think so, because I wrestled Lanny in one of his very first matches, I think. I've got uh, I've got a caller uh, from Texas on uh, air right now who uh, wrestled as the Hood back in the early days. I'd like to welcome an old opponent of yours, uh, Cowboy Johnny Mantell, president of the oh. Wrestling Hall of Fame. Welcome to Heartbeat Radio, Johnny. Thanks, Bob, Bruce, and Tom. And I know Tom will remember uh, my moniker for the hood was H was the most handsome wrestler in the world, and double O was ounce for ounce the best wrestler in the world, and D was for the most dangerous and devastating wrestling wrestler in the world. And I think Tom and I's paths crossed a few times. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I remember you well as a hood. I was. Uh, I thought you were great. First, everybody thought it was your brother, but. Uh, well, first everybody I, thought I was Piper. Oh well, yeah, that's first true. Came yeah. Out was the hood. Everybody when, thought when I was, was Piper. This, uh, was this in L.A. or uh, maybe fill in the blanks here? Uh, when did 19, you guys hook up, Johnny? Nineteen eighty, I started to work for uh, Mike LaBelle. Uh, uh, Los Chavo Angeles. Guerrero, yeah, Chavo Guerrero took over the book and called and wanted me to come in and work a mask gimmick. And um, so, really, I have to give Chavo a lot of the credit. It was his idea of the hood deal. And I just sort of added little bits and pieces there. And, of course, uh, because I trained in L.A. for so long with Chavo and Hector and Mondo and Tor Tanaka and the whole crew that was always there, that uh-huh. um, I sort of learned that style, you know. And, and so it was very easy for Chavo and I to work long matches out there when Chavo was so over. And um, just I really had a great time being tagged up with of course, Ron Starr and Don Jardine came through for a couple of weeks, and they tagged me with him, and it just really gave me an opportunity to work on top and learn sort of that part of the business and working from the heel side, which was only my second time to really get to do that. It was uh, really part of my experience in this business, and I just I loved my time in L.A. I had a lot well, of fun. You did a great job, I'll say that. That, well, that was, was a pretty it was good. Easy, uh, it was easy with those crews, you know. That was a good territory back in those days. You know, you'd hear about the, uh, like the Chabos, and I'm not sure if Gordon and Goliath had already gone through there by that time, or yeah, uh, Killer Buddy, Killer Buddy Austin had been in and out of there. Uh, but that was a pretty good uh, territory back, back in the uh, early '70s. There, they had a lot of. Uh, Iconic workers and uh, a lot of characters. Just some of the names he mentioned: the Ron Stars and the uh, the Chavos and the uh, some of those other names. You know, They're... yeah. When, when did yeah, you? Yeah, they had off? definitely had good talent back then, but by the time they were done, it was the living shits. I'm telling. <laughs> <laughs> who was the uh, who was the main? <laughs> culprit there and uh, dragging it down into that level. <laughs> oh, Michael the, uh, Bell. He was he the... Gave, uh, uh, well, Tom Ernesto was a booker when I went to work for him. <clears throat> Tom and he only gave good. Ernesto so much money to pay the local guys or the you know, undercard guys. He had a I mean, good somebody like the Sheik came in. I know he didn't give them $75. Operator. I was making... There, I was making $75 a week again from LaBelle. And uh, we were feuding with Chris Adams and Ringo Rigby, me and my partner. We were the Reed brothers then, and we were feuding on top with them. And uh, we met outside the office door one day, and they were coming out of there looking mad. And I said, what's wrong? He said, oh, we just got paid. We only got 75 bucks each. And I thought, oh, geez, I'm going to get less. But we went up there, and he gave us $75. But the thing is... I could go up to Saturday nights. I'd go up to Bakersfield and work his opposition, and he, LaBelle didn't know it. And Leone had paid me 150 for a night. So I'm making double on one night what LaBelle paid me all week. See, so, I, I started I started when Chavo had the book, and then they fired Chavo, and I worked just a short while with Tom Ernesto, and then Baron Leone opened up. And I went up and started working for Baron Leone, and you're absolutely right. Baron really took care of us boys and uh, yeah. had a really good little territory going there for a while. Really did. Yeah, he did. It was a lot better than L.A. I mean, no it's question about it. It's funny, back in the day, Johnny, the, uh, his LaBelle was like one of the main guys of the so-called NWA, which was the big thing in those days. And uh, yeah, I remember the... Uh, the Sam Muchniks and the uh, Jim Barnetts and all those guys who were kind of the uh, hierarchy of the NWA, they would uh, call Stu, who was an NWA member, charter member, and all like that. And, right. And 
it was like uh these guys are you're not allowed to you know don't book any of these guys cuz they all worked for Ripper Leone you know and uh, that, that kind of thing that was kind of the uh the MO of the N- NWA back then if anyone was working opposition to well, Mike LaBelle or whoever you know they were supposed to be blackballed by uh all the other NWA guys you know and um, yeah, yeah Ripper Leone uh, wasn't really promoting the same cities as LaBelle so I don't know how he figured he was competition because uh, Leone brought, bought out Louis Miller. He paid him for his territory. And my dad told me Ripper was a pretty good guy. He, did, my da- he had worked for my dad back in the 60s, and not a bad old great. heel, Anton Ripper Leone or whatever. You know. A great a great guy, ran a great business. And we didn't really, we really worked more of Roy Shire's towns than we did Mike LaBelle's towns. I mean, we worked Stockton and Fresno and, some of those northern towns that Roy Shires had run for years, and uh, we did very well in them. Yeah, my dad, my dad told me he had, no, he had no axe to grind at all with Ripper. He, 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 I think he used a lot of guys that Ripper would call <laughs> to and, you know, send some guys up there and that kind of thing. But, yeah, my dad was not a huge fan of uh, old Mike, you know, he he said LaBelle never had done anything for him, you know. And he was well, one like, day I asked Mike, well, they said, somebody asked me, did anybody ever argue with him or get mad at him? I said, well, everybody hated him. I said, but I said to his face, I said, what's it feel like to kill a major territory like he did? And uh, he didn't like that too well, but he was, but it was already he was, was dead. Yeah, I was wrestling Mama Guerrero on the last card they had at the sports arena before WWF came in. And we were supposed to go to a 30-minute Broadway. But after about 10 minutes, I said, oh, let's get the fuck out of here. And uh, I said, pin me. <laughs> so I let him pin me. And we and Ernesto never said a word about it. I think everybody was coming up with their own finishes. No matter what he'd tell them, they'd just ignore him. And uh, do it well, wrong. Bad, you know, cause uh, that, that was, uh, and that pretty much killed the territory. That uh, has been the guys he had underneath are all mostly Mexican guys with hoods on and claiming to be sweet brown sugar. And <laughs> I forget, Kiss was another one. I don't know who he was. And uh, and he had well, Diamond uh, Timothy Flowers. He was there for a while. Oh yeah, Tim Reed. Yeah, yeah. I know. That, I know uh, my. I know my downfall with Mike LaBelle was uh, I was in high school and my brother Kenny was out there wrestling for Mike and Kenny and Piper and Chavo and all of them just had the territory rocking and rolling. And they brought, they brought Mill Moskowitz in. And of course, Mill, right, had to beat my brother too straight in the middle of the ring at the Olympic auditorium. And it just killed the territory for about three or four months for him to get it back up and going again. So when I was out there under the mask as the hood, I was up in the booking office one day with Chavo. We were sort of working on bookings and stuff, and Mike came in, and Mike said, hey, I got Mill Moskers is coming in about six weeks. I need you to work with him when he comes to L.A. And I looked right at him, and I said, Mike, I'm not working with him. And he said, what do you mean? If I'm the boss and I tell you to work with him, you're working with him. And I said, well, I'm going to tell you right now, you book me with him, I'm going to kick his little Mexican ass. And Chavo looked over at me and got madder and hoarding at me for talking back to Mike like that. But I meant it. I wasn't going to work with him and let him just beat me too straight out in the middle of the ring for no reason. When we were drawn, the house was picking up. We were starting to make a little bit of money. The crowd was coming on Friday nights. We were getting people back up in the balcony. And yeah. uh, I wasn't going to I wasn't going to work with him. So they put Dynamite Jack Evans, Eric Verbal, uh, with him. And he came mm-hmm. right too straight, right in the middle of the ring. And uh, that was my downfall with Mike. Was I was one of the guys that I'd speak back and speak my mind, and I just, um, I just don't see anything wrong with that when you're talking about business. And if business is improving, why would you just bring some Hollywood actor in and just put him over your top heel just because? It's not like it's not like the world champion coming over and making your guy look better. It's about right. bringing the guy in and making your guy look worse. So that was my downfall, Mike. Oh, that's pretty much what I thought of him. Yeah, I was a, 
I couldn't believe how he killed this city. He just—he was, he was the cheapest Nick Goulas. He was the West Coast version of Nick Goulas, basically. <laughs> What's old? Uh, I didn't Jamie know Bell everybody ever. hated him except I thought I was the only one. Then I found out everybody hated him. <laughs> yeah, I remember he used to hold court at the, uh, the back in the day at the NWA conventions. They'd have that dog and pony show every. Uh, yeah, it was usually in August in Las Vegas at the Dunes Hotel or whatever. And Mike LaBelle was like one of the, uh, you know, vice president or something like that. But he, that's the first time I ever met him, and he was like looking down his nose at everybody. And for whatever reason, my dad, even though he'd been a charter member of the NWA, uh, Mike LaBelle always treated us like we were kind of backward. Hillbillies or something because we were from Canada or like that kind of thing, and he's always kind of talking down to us. And I think Mike LaBelle's big crony around that time was that old Jim Barnett, who was uh, mm-hmm. Jimsy, as everyone called him, you know. <laughs> and they were kind of like, uh, you know, uh, dictating well, to everyone. Well, they were two peas in a pod, let's just put yeah. it that way. Yeah. And yeah. It, it might be. Reminded me of that movie Good Morning Vietnam, where that uh, the Bruno Ker- Kirby character Mike LaBelle was kind of like that, you know, and talking down yeah. to Stu and uh, a few others, old Fritz von Erich and Harley, and you know he didn't. He didn't. Uh, you know, I remember one time uh, he reproached Harley or Fritz for dropping some f bombs during the meeting, and uh, <laughs> Harley made some disparaging. Um, reference to fags or whatever the hell, you know, but uh, I remember it was, uh, yeah, that was, I was kind of just young in the business, and it was the first time I'd ever seen any of these guys, and you got Jim Z, and I think Sam Muchnick was still around then, but he's sort of like, uh, you know, even above that, he, didn't, he let Mike LaBelle and uh, Barnett kind of run the thing for him, but I remember it was kind of like, <laughs> Interesting uh, dynamic of you know uh, you know all these. Oh, yeah, I still remember the first time I met Sam Muchnick. Uh, Bobby Bruns was working on a was a health and book Kansas City or oh yeah hanging around uh, anyway. Been and he said, "Well, I'm working years. in St. Louis too." He said, "When you're if you come down there, he said look me up. I'll be up at the Claridge Hotel." And I said, oh, "Okay," and it just happened. Two weeks later, Bruiser was uh, working with. Uh, Jack Briscoe, or Dory Funk Jr., I mean, for the title. Oh, yeah. We were were down there at the Checker Dome to see him, so we went up to the Sam's office and asked to see Bob Bruns, and the secretary said, well, he doesn't work here anymore, and Sam come walking out of his office to see who was there. And here we are, two long-haired guys, hair down to our shoulders, and I was almost speechless because I knew he controlled wrestling. Well, he uh, was like the one of the godfathers of the business back then. Oh, yeah. And uh, little I know, another two years I'd be working for him on TV down there. And uh, he was a he was a good payoff guy, too. Yeah, I, I never heard that many bad things about Sam, you know, here, you know, uh, I can't say I've ever heard too much bad about him, but the the other guys that like you were mentioning, uh, LaBelle, and you know, are, I've never heard too many nice things said about him, even from his own brother, uh, half brother Gene LaBelle, you know, who couldn't stand him either, you know. So, yeah, I think, I think Gene. I think Gene should have had a lot more control of that out there. I don't know. I'm not sure who made Mike the boss. I think if Gene would have had a little more control and power out there, I think the L.A. territory would have stayed a, a, a good territory to go to. But I was going to ask you, Johnny, uh, how, how did you guys work any uh, more after that, or did you guys just have that, uh, you and Tom interact in uh, L.A.? Did, I, did you guys do anything after that in any other territories? Or? I don't I don't know that our paths crossed again, did they, Tom? I came back here to Texas and... Stayed going to Japan and and working between Mid South and Dallas and I don't know that our paths crossed again after that. Well, 
you might not remember this, probably don't, but I, I actually wrestled you in a shoot. I was working out with some guy who was training in the ring at the Olympic, and uh, Gene LaBelle and uh, Leo Garibaldi, and you and Terry Sawyer, and Nick and Bobby Bachwinkle were all there. Then they came down to the ring. Everybody came down to the ring, and he got this guy who was training, put him in the ring with Terry Sawyer. I thought he was going to see if he could work or not. So I said, just feed him your arm. I said, just go with him. I said, don't worry. But Terry, you know, they, they told him to shoot on him. And pretty soon, you know, it took 10 seconds. Terry had him in an ankle lock, and he was screaming for mercy to get out. So he stopped it, and then uh, Leo points at me and says, you're next. He <laughs> said, but with him, and he pointed to you. And I thought, well, okay. So we got in the ring. You didn't, you didn't know it was a shoot, and I wasn't sure what he was doing. And uh, we locked up, and I got you down in a crucifix. And you still didn't know it was shoot. Then Leo starts yelling, "Shoot, shoot, shoot!" But it was too late. And uh, <laughs> I, that really pissed him off. <laughs> And he'd never booked me. I couldn't get booked in L.A. until Ernesto came in. Wow. Yeah, when I first when I first started training with Leo, he took me to the ring first, and then it was um, um, Rich Hughes Dugan and Thor Tanaka, and all those guys would spend time with me. And the first pro that I really spent time with in the ring was Dory Funk because he was Every he was flying was in. out here. What what era was this, Johnny? Early seventies, somewhere in there. Seventy six. An old Dory uh, would have yeah. been. He yeah. Been long since. I moved out here in seventy six. To LA. This was seventy six when Leo, because Leo took it upon himself to smart me up and break me into the business. And and it's funny, you know, we just found a picture the other night of me and. Leo and my brother Kenny in in uh, well, Tampa, was, Florida, was on a boat. La, was this LaBelle's uh, under his umbrella at that time, or was it Shire's? Yes. Or no, it was Mike. it was Mike LaBelle. Yeah, yeah. Leo was the booker at that time. Then when Leo left, I think Red Bastien took over for a little bit. I was going to ask you, uh, Tom. You, you had a. Another run with the uh, Hawaii bunch. Uh, how did that happen? I was intrigued because I know back in the day, Dynamite and myself and uh, a few others got dragged into that cesspool down there <laughs> with uh, Leah, Lars Anderson, and all that. Uh, it was all yeah, like, Lars uh, a real piece of work. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I remember. Uh, <laughs> Like twenty five dollar a week payoffs, <laughs> stuff like that, and uh, they had promised. Oh, I'd get in screaming matches with him every time he paid me off. And, and I, I remember all the uh, it was. It was uh, <laughs> I, I remember Dynamite. Now I always used to say uh, nightmares do come true in Blue Hawaii. <laughs> 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 Everything from Leah and these Samoans, and I remember Dwayne Johnson was just kind of a young uh, Rocky was down there, and uh, yeah, I remember him when he was like thirteen. And, yeah, and they were staying in some uh, cockroach-infested uh, place called Chateau Blue, which is where they were staying, and and Peter was in failing health around that time, and Leah was uh, <laughs> she was uh, a piece of work too, you know. But I remember, I remember it was. Uh, it was uh, interesting, to say the least. But what, what years were you were there? I was wondering. Uh, I'm surprised. I was there in '85 and '86. And yeah, uh, I'd been there. I think Dynamite and I were down there in like '80, 1980, I think somewhere in there. You know, and there was a few old relics kicking around there. Mondo <laughs> Guerrero was around a bit, and uh, I think Don Morocco was in and out. And uh, right. Uh, yeah, I thought I'd retired from wrestling because I was working for California Championship Wrestling after LaBelle went out of business. And that was like the worst promotion ever. 
And in the middle of a match, I thought, you know, this is a, this is my last match. And uh, I told the guy I was wrestling. His name was Spider Savage. He wore like a yellow mask and a yellow bodysuit. Covered, bent over a tight shoe. He looked like a banana. <laughs> and uh, I was wrestling him. I said, okay, it said, charge me at the ropes, and I'll catch you, and we'll roll out of the ring together. And he said, okay. And I, I see him come charging at me, but his head's headed right for my balls. So I rolled out of the ring just when he got there, and he went through the ropes and landed on the floor, and the referee counted him out. And then he said, what happened? I thought you were going to catch me. And I said, God, I guess I missed. And I, I thought know, that was my last match, but I was sitting at home uh, blackballed after about that. a year later, and I got a call from Zulu, magnificent Zulu, Ron Pope. Whoa! <laughs> and he asked if I wanted to work in Hawaii, and I thought, what the what's he got to do with Hawaii? I said, why? Who's booking over there? And he says Lars Anderson. And well, I hadn't heard much about Lars, and I said, well, tell him to call me. And uh, shockingly, about 10 minutes later, Lars calls me. I guess Zulu told him how good I was doing, could cut a promo. And uh, Lars said, if you can send me five weeks' worth of uh, tapes, tape them there, send them to me, and I'll run them on TV, and we'll use you on this certain date. And uh, so I did. I taped them, sent them to him, and he loved them. And when I got there, I was, well, I got the first night I worked five times, I think. I managed Tully Blanchard, managed three other guys, and I wrestled under the under the hood, Mr. Z. And uh, <laughs> he tried to give me $150 for that, and the place was sold out, and Leah kept saying, oh, thank you, thank you for this, and kept hugging me, just for promos I guess and then when I went out there I uh, accidentally started a riot and I said something they took as a racially offensive I don't even know what I said and uh, the <laughs> chairs start flying in the ring was at this me. with the Samoans or and the, uh... Tolly comes and grabs me and pulls me out of the ring and we get to the back and Leah I thought she'd be pissed off but she was she was Come up and hug me. He's, oh, thank you. Thank you for getting the fans so worked up. Thank you. <laughs> so I thought, oh, great. And then like, when, at the end of the night, Lars says, well, tells me and tell me, tell me meet, meet me at this hotel at 1 o'clock. We'll, we'll pay you. And I thought, what the fuck? Wait until 1 o'clock to pay me. Okay, so Tully and I went out and drank some beer. Then we went to the hotel. We walked in the door. There on the table was a pile of money and about six lines of cocaine. And I knew right away what Lars was up to. He wanted us to do the cocaine so he wouldn't have to pay us. He figured we'd snort it up. And uh, Tolly obliged, but I said, no, I want the money. So he gave me $150. And I handed it back to him. I said, this is way short. And we got into a screaming match. But as much as Lars could scream, I could out-scream him and out-insult him, no problem. And I ended up getting five hundred dollars from him. So every time I got paid by him, it was the same scenario. I had to fight with him and argue with him, but he always came through in the end. How long did you last there, uh, Tom? That that was that was a, a tough place to make a living, as I recall. But uh, yeah, although when I got to Hawaii, I, I fell in love with it. I had no inclination to even go there before. Well, as soon as I yeah, got I there, I fell in love with it. And uh, yeah, yeah. I almost moved there. The TV announcers had a car dealership, too, and offered me a job selling cars. Because I guess he liked my promos. So, And I turned him down, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'd be sitting on the beach right now. Instead of in smoggy L.A. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, guys, I, I wanted to call in and say hi to Tom and, and uh, Bob and Bruce. Thank you guys for everything you do. Tom, you get a chance for me to visit us in Wichita Falls and come see the PWHF, man. I think you'd love to be here and see what we're doing. That's a true Hall of Fame there. Thanks, Tony. 
And again, Bob yeah. Johnson here from uh, we're talking to uh, Tom Hankins and uh, Bruce Hart here on Heartbeat Radio on PWP Nation. What a great show we've had so far. Uh, I've got a, a couple of questions uh, from a couple of our uh, fans. I have one question here from uh, Brian in Idaho. Uh, Brian said he has read your book, Tom, and if you could talk a little bit about your career with uh, Fat Eddie. If you could oh, yeah, Fat Eddie, Eddie Wiedelstadt. <clears throat> well, he was like a, Jew, it was a Jewish mafia. And they controlled all the porn in the country. They had a big warehouse in Cleveland. It was like two blocks square, all filled with porn, and they'd ship it out all over the country. I think that's the first time we've ever had the word porn on our show, uh, (laughs) Tom. (laughs) Yeah, and I managed, uh, I think, seven stores from from Indiana to Utah and uh, collect the money. Out of the did, movie arcades, well, I didn't collect it. I wasn't with, going in there. But how did you cross paths with Fat Eddie or Fast Eddie or whatever his name is? Uh, well, he, my mother-in-law was, was working as a nanny for him, and I was—I'd just come back from Kentucky wrestling. I was going to go to Mississippi, but I came back to Iowa for a couple of weeks. And he convinced. He asked me if I wanted to be his warehouse manager. I don't know why, but I had bleached blonde hair, and I guess I looked like a wrestler. And he asked me if I wanted to be his warehouse manager. I said, "Well, I said I'm going to Mississippi. So, well, you'll make more money here, I guarantee you." And uh, he was right. And I started out on the way to Mississippi, and after about an hour, I started. Oh, fuck it! And I turned around, went back home. I said, "Okay, I'll take your job." And the uh, only thing is, I didn't call Saul Weingroff and tell him. He's the one that booked me down into Mississippi. I should have called him. I regret that. And uh, But then I went to work for Eddie, and within a month, I was like his right-hand man. Travel with him everywhere. He'd go get and pick fights with people and make me fight him, me and his other bodyguards. And... Uh, it was uh, unbelievable. The, st- the amount of money came in. Everybody was stealing from him, and he didn't even miss it. He made so much money. And he got busted on taxes, did seven years in the prison hospital. And I think he's back in again. They busted him a couple of years ago, and he's back in again. But it was strictly strictly porn, and... Uh, Magazines, novelties, films, everything. We had like three warehouses full of that stuff. And we sit out in the loading dock and roll joints and smoke joints. And uh, there's a big empty factory building like right across the street. And I said, you know, the FBI is probably sitting in there taping us. So I'd flip it off, flip them off every now and then. And sure enough, they were in there taping us. <laughs> when I quit, I got mad at Eddie and quit. Took the keys to all his stores and where else and threw them at him. Didn't really hang, but I hit him right between the eyes with them. And he got, he was furious, but his bodyguard, this big black guy named Butch, was my best friend at the time. And Butch just shook his head no, he wasn't going to do nothing. He told me later he thought it was funny. And I quit, went home, and Eddie fired everybody that I'd hired which was probably 10 people. And uh, the FBI calls me on the phone. He says, we understand you don't work for Eddie anymore. I said, how do you understand that? He said, well, we've been listening. And uh, so I went and talked to them, and they were complete boobs. They they did like a two-, three-hour question and answer with us and stuff, and the their tape recorder malfunction. They didn't notice it and didn't get any of it on tape. And they handed me a stack of pictures and said, what about these pictures? Let me know who you recognize. And about every fourth picture was me. And I realized they'd been following me all over the country, taking pictures of me. There's one of them standing out in a field somewhere in Nebraska taking a pee, and they got a picture of it. And... Uh, <laughs> 
about every fourth picture was me. And I finally found one of me flipping them off. I said, oh, here, I recognize me, and I handed it to him. So I'm flipping them off again, actually. And uh, nothing really came of that except uh, Eddie stole Ted Turner's films. He had a semi full of films that These were like uh, rest, Ted Turner owned, and they stole his truck somehow. And my wife is the only one to see Eddie in possession with the films. And the FBI, after I moved to California, they came and got her and took her back as a witness and locked him up again for stealing the films. What, so what I've tried frame? to stay away from Eddie since then, but uh, he had what some wild were? parties, and he'd bring in people to wrestle me and fight me, but none of them knew how to wrestle, so it was, it was like nothing. Take him down, make him start screaming. Once I left there, I uh, didn't do really much of anything. I went down to went to Georgia to wrestle in Atlanta, and I wrestled Johnny Walker, and he drop kicked me so hard he gave me a, in the head. He gave me a concussion, and I didn't pass out, but I couldn't see. Everything went black, and he picked me up to throw me into the ropes, and I just collapsed on the f- mat. I thought, well, fuck! I know I haven't run out of wind. I, thought, I didn't realize I had a concussion. And uh, but I did remember the finish, so I managed somehow to get to my feet so he could give me his knee drop. And uh, two guys had to carry me back to the dressing room because I couldn't see a thing. And I thought, shit, I'm blind. And uh, Abdullah the Butcher and Dory Funk Jr. are in the dressing room, and they said, oh, it said, sounds like you got a concussion. You should just relax, and your sight will come back. It should come back. And it did. But it blew it blew my whole a uh, Georgia shot, and I was going to go to Florida the next week and work too, work TV down there. So I had to cancel all of that, and I was out for about. Well, I was out till I started working in uh, L.A. in '81, I guess. In '81, I went to a wrestling convention in Houston and uh, met Paul Bosch, Nick Bockwinkel, Luthez and infamous Eddie Mansfield, and uh, they all convinced me I should get back into the business. And then when I got back here uh, and found out about Leone running up there, I thought, well, maybe I should, and I started working out again, started lifting weights and running. And then when I met Jerry Graham, he put me through just horrendous routines, like the Hindu routine and Make me do for like 500 squats, and I'd have to do push-ups with Jerry on my back, and he weighed about 400 pounds. But I could get 10 push-ups out with him standing there, and he just gave us really grueling training. When he was sober, he really knew what he was doing. He had a great mind for wrestling. <coughs> Excuse me. In uh, '85, he told me, "You know, it's the future. The business is flying. It's flying over the ropes. It's flying." And he was—he was right. Because that's what the business is now, pretty much. Yeah, well, I watch a lot of that. New Japan, and I think they got it right. Uh, we've got a, uh, got a question here from uh, one of our uh, wrestling uh, listeners in uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin, Kyle. And Kyle has asked, uh, can you ask Tom, I guess he's read your book, and he wanted to uh, ask Tom about uh, how he wound up as a guest on the Phil Donahue show in the midst of the... WWE sex scandal. Is that right? Well, that you? was uh, right after Jerry had gone and done Tuesday Night Titans, and I was sitting at the uh, after they had matches here at the sports arena. I was sitting at the bar downtown at the Hilton Hotel with Andre the Giant and Jerry Graham trying to out drink each other, but Andre won, <laughs> and. Uh, Patterson was on the other side, and I was talking to him. I said, why don't you use me in a couple spot shows here before we go to New York? He said, what, you're coming to New York? He hated Jerry, hated his guts. And I said, yeah. I said, didn't you see Tuesday Night Titans last week? And Pat was drunk, but he wasn't like sloppy drunk. He was just drunk. And uh, he said, no, I didn't know you were coming. He said, uh, well... He said, I want to give you a blowjob. 
I said, what? I knew he was gay, but he said, I want to give you a blowjob. And I said, well, plus I'm not interested. I said, do what you want. I said, but I'm not interested. And he goes, well, does that make me a bad guy? I said, no, it just makes you a cocksucker. And that was the end of the WWE relationship. After that, Vince wouldn't even take my calls. So Patterson got us out before we got in. What year was this, uh, Tom? Or that was this, uh, 85. Somewhere when they were just in the, uh, just getting launched there with WrestleMania and all like that. Yeah. Was old uh, Mike LaBelle, he was involved with Vince Jr. for a stretch there, wasn't he? Uh, like back in the early Well, uh, yeah, Vince came in, told him they were going to be partners. And since LaBelle was down the toilet already, I guess he figured yeah, he had I, nothing I, to lose and everything to gain. But I think they did, it was like, Two shows together, Vince sent in some guys, and uh, after that he cut LaBelle out. Somebody, some people say he got 10%, but I don't think he did. I think he just got cut out completely. Yeah, that's and pretty Vince, much Vince just took over. Yeah, it's, when Vince is just getting uh, launched right around the uh, pre WrestleMania 1. Mike LaBelle seemed to be, he was like one of the guys calling Stu and others and endorsing and, you know, trying to get everyone on board. And then uh, he seemed to be uh, gone when the uh, thing took off with Hulk and Andre and all like that. And I never really heard his name after that, you know. But how's how's your book sales been going? Going, Tom. Uh, I, you know, I'd like to, for any of our listeners, uh, how can they uh, get it if they? Uh, is it in bookstores or is it online? Or it's uh, uh, get it from crowbarpress dot com. Crowbarpress dot com. And, and yeah, one more time, back, what's if you the hit, exact... go there, it'll be right on the first page you hit. And what's the exact title again? One more time, in case it's any of the them... mat. The mob and the music. Uh, of those three industries, uh, which one do you find to be the the shadiest or the <laughs> most seedy and, you know, uh, morally bankrupt or whatever of, of those three? Well, uh, well, that's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say, well, definitely the uh, the mob. It was, oh, that's, uh, that's good then. I, I'm somewhat thieves, <laughs> thieves stealing, <clears throat> stealing from thieves, stealing from other thieves. I mean, and uh, a lot of backstabbing going on there. And uh, I'd say wrestling was probably second. <laughs> Although music, that's a lot of backstabbing there too. Yeah. And when I first met Jim Morrison. Uh, what was he like? It was in uh, 66, and they hadn't been signed sort of, yet. Doors hadn't. And uh, were, were, were they from uh, California, too? Or, uh, yeah, they were from Los Angeles. And uh, there's a big club called the Hullabaloo Club, and our manager booked us there. And he said, I want to show you something. And he drove us down the Sunset Boulevard in his convertible. Time. And he says, look, there's a big marquee. It says, the band my, I had by then was named The Orphans. It said, the Orphans. says, opening the doors. It's was like, what? I had to follow Jim Morrison on stage? I'd seen him once, and he blew me away. And I thought, Jesus Christ, how am I going to get up there and follow him? And so sing like he does. But... We pooled all our equipment together, both bands, so we had enough for this big venue. And uh worked out pretty good. Jim gave me a... Well, I hadn't seen him. There was no sound check or anything. Somebody tapped me on the shoulder and goes, Here, man. And I turned around, and there's Morrison handing me a joint. So I said, well, Okay, I smoked it with him. Became friends with him. Dropped acid with him. And we go sit on a rooftop on Venice Beach on the Venice bo- Boardwalk. He kind of lived up there half the time. And he had a girlfriend's house he'd live at some of the rest of the time. But we'd drop acid up there. We'd drop acid and go to Barney's Beanery, a famous bar here. And we'd sit there all day laughing and 
just tripping out. I don't know. He was quite a character, but he was really smart. And uh, his but he was always was high. Sort of taken I mean, off always. around that time, eh? Pardon? It was just taking off around that time. His his career yeah, was yeah because within a year they were signed and their first album was out. Finger got killed in a motorcycle wreck, so they went that. Well, Frank Zappa, I met him. He uh, would we lived in a place called the House of Awareness. It was a, like a hippie hippie and horror pad, I guess, and. Uh, Frank would come well, every couple of days, just bring his friends with him and walk through. And we had, my wife and I uh, just had a baby, had a daughter, Christine, and Frank was the first one to bring her to bring her presents. He's probably the only one with any money because they were signed and they were, they had their first album out already. But Frank never did drugs, never drank or anything. He just played guitar perfectly. Got a caller from uh, Baltimore, uh, Lewis. Uh, Lewis wanted to ask uh, Tom uh, what it was like uh, performing with Chuck Berry and Chubby Checker. Uh, Chubby Checker was real easy. I mean, his songs weren't that hard. Chuck Berry was another story. I ran into him in a diner. I was Coming back from Des Moines, Iowa, to Cedar Rapids, after playing, I ran into him in a greasy a greasy spoon diner. I was driving by. The guitar player was with me, Dick Douglas. And uh, I said, look, Chuck Berry's in there. He goes, no, nah, it's not Chuck Berry. I said, yes, it is. That's Chuck Berry. And I slammed on my brakes, turned the car around, pulled into the parking lot. And that was Chuck sitting there by himself at the counter. So we went in, sat on both sides of him, started talking to him, and the waitress wouldn't serve him because he was black. And so I went into a tirade with all the customers in there, so I thought you'd be bowing down with the king of rock and roll instead of treating him like shit. And Frank, I mean, Chuck finally got his uh, order. All he wanted was two fried eggs. So they gave him two fried eggs. We just threw him in a sack. No wrapping, no nothing. <laughs> and that was that was it. And he walked out in the parking lot. We went out with him. And he said, boy, that band backing me up tonight. He said, they really stunk. I said, the stompers? He said, yeah. He said, I gave him two instructions. When I stomp my left foot, start. When I stomp my right foot, stop. He said, but they couldn't follow it. I said, well, so I guess they got the wrong name then. Because I, I said, I know. I said, they stink. I said, we know every one of your songs, every one of them. I said, no, and uh, we convinced Chuck. We got the ballroom owner in Cedar Rapids to get out of bed at 3 in the morning so Chuck could hear us. We went down to the ballroom, and he heard us for about 10 minutes, and he said, okay. He said, you're hired. And he hired the whole band. We were 17 and 18 at the time, and uh, we toured with him for three months during the summer before my senior year in high school. And he was really the first uh, guy I went on tour with. But then we played with the Animals, toured with them, and Dave Clark Five, and I don't know, there's so many of them, I can't even remember them all. The Everly Brothers. How were they? They backed up a lot of people, and... uh, Eventually, we decided we wanted to go to California and meet Phil Spector. So we did. He didn't shoot us, luckily. And uh, he liked us and recorded us. But like I said, the singer got killed, so that was the end of that. So then I came back to Iowa in 1969. It was August 1969. I... Dropped two hits of acid, Orange Sunshine, and went to see The Grateful Dead. And uh, they weren't even one of my favorite bands. I don't know, but I went. But I saw on the paper the next night, it was wrestling at the International Amphitheater. And uh, Bruiser and Crusher against the Chain Gang. And I think the Chain Gang is still one of the great gimmicks, but they never get away with it today. But And... I was still tripping. It was the second day, but I wasn't so wasn't so intense. 
And uh, I told my wife, I'm going to be a wrestler because I'd always wanted to. And I said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to, after seeing all the blood and seeing the fans in Chicago, I said, oh, this is for me. So I told her I was going to be a wrestler, and she laughed at me. Got back, I told the Dan Daniels, my guitar player, I said, I'm going to quit and be a wrestler. And he said, well, I love wrestling. And we never even talked about it before. I said, and he ended up, he grew up next in Hawaii, next door to Ed Francis, lived next door to Ed Francis. So he knew wow. Billy and Russ Francis and all the other kids. And he he was an expert on Hawaii wrestling. And they had great wrestling back then. Uh, Ed, Ed had been the brother and for my so dad. So we ended up training until 73 when Gus Karras told us to go ahead. And But we first we approached Harley Race and kept telling them to be wrestlers. And and the promoter was, was uh, Frosty Miller. He finally introduced us to Harley. And then we kind of more or less stalked him, I guess, every time he came to Iowa. I was old Harley. And, uh, one really interesting thing, we were having dinner with him one night before the matches, and he's one of the few guys I knew that could eat a huge dinner and go out and wrestle 90 minutes. And uh, he told us his plan to win the world title. He said, i got to work St. Louis every show. He said, i got to go to Japan as often as I can. He said, but if you don't get over in St. Louis, you're never going to get the belt. He said, I want that belt. And he did it, did it right, just like he told us he was going to do. And uh, I was kind of surprised that he told us that, but he knew we were smart. So I guess he didn't care, and he did everything he said he was going to do. <laughs> yeah, he was a pretty good old, pretty good old boy, old Harley. He... Uh... He was uh, one of the one of the best uh, world champions I think they ever had, old Harley. But oh yeah, definitely. Do you ever, do you ever uh, still touch bases with Harley, uh, Tom? Or uh, I haven't since the last CAC that I went to, which is probably seven years ago. Oh, is that right? He's yeah, yeah. We had him on our show a few times last year. I. Uh, yeah, he did. Yeah, a great guy, old Harley. I uh, had a lot of... Yeah, because I'd been working for the you know, Saul Weingross uh, Outlaw promotion down south with the Von Brauners. And the Von Brauners took us in the ring and every day and worked with us for like two or three hours. And I could tell every day I was getting better and better from stuff I learned from them. And... Uh, when I came back to Iowa, I told Gus Karras we'd been working for and He said, oh, you should never do that. Don't work against the NWA. He said, Sam will blackball you. And uh, I said, well, I hope not. I said, but i got to feed my family, pay my mortgage. I said, i got to do something. And uh, hoping he'd ask me to come into Kansas City, although that wasn't very big paying territory either. But... A few weeks after that, we get a call out of the blue one Saturday, and it's uh, Bob Geigel calling us, wanted us to come down to St. Joe, Missouri to do TV on a Saturday night, and then to do St. Louis TV on Sunday morning. So we went down there, and uh, I had a horrible match with Mike George on Saturday night. Then Sunday, we were... I was in St. Louis. It was like a Hall of Fame. First, Bill Miller, Ron Schmidt walks in, Bill Miller, uh, Ron Fuller, Jack Briscoe, Pat O'Connor, Harley Race. Just <laughs> yeah, those Ron are all, Schmidt, uh, icons. Black right. Angus. And uh, there was surrounded by greatness. It was like a living Hall of Fame in there to me. And I was in awe of it. And then they called, uh, I think Race said, I was going with Charlie Reed at the time. He goes, Reed, Briscoe, come over here. I thought, oh, shit, I'm going to wrestle the world champion. I said, great. And sure enough, I was. And uh, they uh, told us to go, I don't know how many minutes, six, seven minutes. And there was one spot where I was going to 
get drop kicked through the ropes out on the floor, and Harley Race is going to come out and like act like he was plotting with me, and then Bristol will get out of the ring and argue with him. Then I Pearl Harbor Jack from behind, knocked him to the floor and jumped back in the ring. But then Bristol came back on race outside the ring, got back in and drop kicked me twice and put me in the figure four leg lock so I'd submit. But he put that leg lock on so lightly that I had to look to make sure he had it on. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't even really feel it. It was just, he worked so perfectly. And he's probably the best guy I was ever in the ring with. He was fast. And he taught me something a lot that day that you got to be really fast, especially in St. <clears throat> <Saint> Louis. <clears throat> yeah, those those are uh, those are among the, the best workers of that era. You know, those are all icon legends, Harley and Jack, and uh, some of the others you mentioned. You know, those are about uh, the cream of the crop at that time. Yeah, and that day uh, Bill Miller Taylor. told me my first Dr. Jerry Graham story, and turned out it was true. Said <laughs> <laughs> so Jerry was on the way to the matches in Ohio somewhere. He already had his trunks and boots on, and his car died. And he didn't. He opened up the hood and didn't know what to do, so he did the thing he did best. He got his blade out, bladed his head from ear to ear. There he is standing in the middle of the street in his wrestling trunks, blood dripping down his face. And somebody stopped to help him, and he jumped in the car and said, Quick, take me to the TV studio. And told him where. And this guy, I imagine the driver thinking, TV studio? I said, Well, what good would blood do on radio? So he took him to the TV studio. And I asked Jerry later, Is that a true story? He goes, Oh, yeah, 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 that was true. And I asked him about some of these other stories I'd heard about him. He said, yeah, it was true. <laughs> and after hanging out with him, I found out they were true. And uh, I, I think the last every time I was with him, it was a memorable experience. It was He'd do something to get in trouble somewhere. I think my dad told me the last time he ever saw Jerry Graham was maybe, uh, maybe in the 80s or something like that. Uh, about two in the morning, my dad said he was sleeping, and uh, here's this pounding on his bedroom door. <laughs> he had some other come into the house, and uh, and my dad had hadn't seen him in years, and he told me that Jerry uh, was uh, completely drunk, and he uh, he said his wife, who was originally from Calgary, had left him, and. Uh, He's pounding on the door and saying, Stuart's the good doctor, and uh, I need you to come and kidnap my wife with me or something. <laughs> and my, my dad, uh, I remember my dad called me the next morning to tell me this. and said, that an old bastard Jerry Graham uh, was pounding on my door at uh, 2 in the morning wanting me to come and kidnap his wife or something. <laughs> it's kind of like one of the... Uh, Last time they ever heard of old doc, the good doctor, you know. But. Yeah, he used to tell the stories how him and Wayne Coleman would uh, rob stores in Arizona or rob gas stations because they weren't making any money working down there. And I didn't believe him at first. But then I talked to this superstar when I was on the Phil Donahue show. And he... Uh, didn't really admit it, but I could tell. Yeah, he he did it. Yeah, he he was uh, <laughs> he he was not uh, you know always on the right side of the uh, the law either. All the uh, superstar, you know, he was a pretty good operator himself. You know. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I got a story about Mill Moscaris. Uh, I actually liked working with him. I went to Mexico and feuded with him. It was me and Angel Blanco against him and El Solitario. And we worked every night together. And the first night, I mean, I'd heard about Mill not selling and not, you know, not letting anybody put him over or pin him. And uh, it was a tag match where both partners had to be pinned. 
So I figured Blanco would pin him and I'd pin Solitario. But all of a sudden, Mosker says to me, pin me right now, pin me. And I wasn't even expecting it. I hadn't even used a legal hold. I just brawled the whole match. So I kicked him in the gut and rolled him up in a small package and pinned him. And he actually let me pin him. I was shocked. Although we ended up losing the match. But, you know, out of the ring, he hung out with me without, you know, without his mask. And he uh, was real nice to me. And we had some uh, bloody matches in all of Mexico. And I never had any problem with him not selling. And I sold for him. But when I first got there, first thing he walks up to me in the dressing room, he tells me who he is and how, who the other guys are. I said, well, I know who all you are. I said, I know everybody here, who they are. And he said, well, you should respect us. We we demand respect. And I said, well, I respect you. I said, I respect you more than anybody. I was lying to him. But... Uh, because it can't be easy working a whole match sucking your gut in like that. <laughs> but I don't know. I just got along with him after that. And uh, he took me to breakfast the next morning. And he'd take me. And we guess we hung out together and ate together and everything. So I have seen him without his mask. I guess not many people have. But I got to think a lot. He took it off in the dressing room other places. But I've heard some people say that he wouldn't take it off. He won't take it off now because he's bald. <laughs> I got a picture of him, his mask ripped, and he's blading, and you can see that his hair in the front is all gone. So by now he must be totally bald. So I think hey, that's why not, he keeps wearing his mask. He doesn't work anymore, does he? Or well, every now and then I see you. that he does. I was uh, talking to my old buddy Terry Funk a while back, and maybe a year or two ago, he told me that he was having some kind of a penultimate retirement match with Mil Mascaras in uh, Japan or some damn thing. I don't know if it ever came off or or what. Yeah, you know, I think but, I heard about that, but yeah, I don't know if it did either. <laughs> yeah. But Mil was 10 years older than me. Exactly. <clears throat> so he'd be 78 now. So it's hard for me to imagine him working now. But if they put him in like a six-man tag and he does like one or two moves, I guess he'd get away with that. Uh, he's maybe been getting away with that for the last 20, 30 years. <laughs> anyway. So. Well, one match I had with him, I decided I'm going to see if I can make him blow up. Just be able to a smart ass. I said, I'm going to make see if I can make him blow up. And uh, I did, and he was standing on the floor on one side of the ring, just leaning on the ring, just panting and gasping. But here I was on the other side of the ring doing the same thing. I blew myself up, too. (laughs) (laughs) But I did manage to blow him up. I was going to ask you about one other legendary guy, uh, Tom, that we knew pretty well up here. Uh, King Curtis. Oh yeah. yeah. What was your? Well, I met him on the beach in Hawaii. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, well, Lars told me he had a thing where he rented board, out boogie yeah, boards and surfboards and, surf and, and umbrellas and stuff. So I went up and I saw him sitting there. I went up and talked to him. Told him I worked with Jerry Graham's son. He goes, "Oh, Jerry!" And Curtis hugged me. He said, "Jerry bought me my first tailor-made suit in New York." And I said, really? And then Curtis said, he wants some pot? I said, sure. So he pulls out a joint, and we sit there in the beach smoking a joint. Yeah, and he started he, telling he, me about his LSD-laced cookies that he gave the boys on a trip to Japan when they were on the plane. And I forget who it was. Somebody really freaked out because they didn't yeah. know that they were getting acid. And... uh he yeah, even he took me up and showed me where uh, he grew his pot, where they grew the pot. And uh, he gave me oops, surfboards and stuff to use for free. And uh, yeah, he was a great guy, nice to me, really nice. Yeah, I I, uh, I found him to be a really engaging, interesting guy. You know, pretty intelligent, too, you know, he pretty... Uh, yeah. Yeah, we had him up here for a long stretch. I 
I spent time with him down in Hawaii too. He had a nice ranch out in Maui there, and uh, his dad was, I think his dad was the chief of police or some such thing. Yeah, I think he was, yeah. Uh, captain or whatever we used to call him, you know. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, he was a, it's a great a- guy, old king, you know. I, I don't know that many people had ever crossed paths with him now, you know. He's been, you know, from a, another era, but uh, yeah. Uh, he and Mark Lewin were kind of the uh, uh, the, the the pair. They, they had a long stretch all over the place in Australia. Oh, yeah, and, uh, they they were kind of like uh, you know everywhere Curtis went was uh, he was kind of even the forerunner of the Sheik in uh, Abbey. You know, with the bloodbaths yeah. and the, you know the all that other, but. Uh, I heard yeah, the announcer in Calgary got mad at him, didn't he, for too much juice or something? Or? Oh, yeah, the commission, you know, I think every night, I think my dad had a, at the same time, he had he had a crew up here of King Curtis and Abdullah and uh, I think a guy named Blackjack Slade and Big Bad John and Mark Lewin and uh, two or three others and all the hardcore you know, Sheik, I think, was up here for a stretch. Eddie Farhat, too, with them. At, uh-huh. um, so it was like <laughs> every night there was, this is long before ECW, you know, they, it was kind of bloodbaths and Texas death chain, no DQ, <laughs> all yeah. that stuff. And the commission, uh, I think they threatened to shut my dad down because <laughs> there was too much, uh, you know, brawling out in the crowd and crazy stuff, you know, but yeah, interesting uh, group, you know, Mark and Curtis and all those guys, you know. Well, you know, I actually picked up Stampede Wrestling on TV in Iowa. That fat Eddie I used to work for, he had a gigantic antenna on top of his house that would turn, and one night, I don't know, I was sitting there watching his TV, and I got Stampede Wrestling, and Curtis was on there. That just happened to be on that show. That was the only time I ever picked it up. And uh, I remember he was went wild on the, on the show. Oh, yeah. And, uh, I tried to pick it up again because it was so good, but it, I never could. Yeah, it, it was uh, <laughs> like the dark ages of Stampede Wrestling. <laughs> My my dad almost got shut down by all the commissions up here, and it was kind of like the, uh, you know, uh, everything was bad publicity and all that at that time. But uh, we, we have a we have a question here from uh, Mike from Waterloo, Iowa. He's actually got two questions for Tom, and he says, uh, if you could, uh, Mike, uh, a good friend of ours from the uh, the uh, Don Gable Museum. Uh, what was it like to wrestle with Danny Hodge? I, he understands that you re- wrestled him one time. Well, it's a lot. <clears throat> excuse me, a lot like Jack Briscoe. Uh, actually, I probably put him on an equal level. And the last time, I didn't really wrestle him. I was at CAC, sitting next to him, and I was talking to him. And I said, well, "I wish you'd have been around in 1969 to train me." He goes, "Well, it's never too late." And all of a sudden, I'm clamped in his what I call his death lock. He said, see, if you move your neck this way, you'll break it. And if I move you this way, you're gonna... and I'm locked up there. And our wives are embarrassed, but Lou Thez was sitting there, too, and just a couple of months before Lou died, and Lou started laughing like hell. And I th- that was good, because Lou was looking bad that weekend. That's the first time I saw him laugh. Uh, yeah. I, have a, I have a question here from a uh, longtime uh, friend of ours, uh, Carmine, from Oklahoma City. He says, uh, can you ask Tom if he watches any of the current WWE product? Uh, no, I retired in 86. So, uh, no, although I watched them all come up through the independent ranks here in L.A., pro wrestling gorilla mainly. The only things I watch are New Japan, and uh, I watch Lucha Underground, but... <clears throat> Got to look at that differently. I look at it as like a TV series. 
It's like science fiction and drama and comedy all based around wrestling. I've been told that in the past that my show is going to the dogs, so that seems to be the case here. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's maybe a fitting way for me to wind this episode up here. I don't know. Again, if you could call the fans of Heartbeat Radio where they can get the book. Crowbarpest.com, The Mat, The Mob, and The Music. <laughs> 